So today is the, the first part of a two-part lecture on query optimizer implementation. Um, and so this is, again, this is, to me, this is the most interesting part of a database system, and this is the part I, I fully admit that I know the least about, because um, this, sort of, this is like the black art of, of, of a database system and how these things actually work. So today we're sort of talking off uh, some background about, um, about what query optimization actually means, uh, what the system is actually doing on the inside, and then we'll talk about uh, some things we keep in the back of our minds as we implement a, a query optimizer. But then we're going to spend most of our time talking about the search strategies, because that's sort of the key part about how you would actually implement this. So the paper I had you guys read was from uh, this a, an influential system from the 1990s called Cascades, and sort of that's one search model strategy you could use for, for, for a query optimizer. And we'll see variants of this. We'll sort of see how we got to the point where something like Cascades came about, like what, what was sort of being done before. Um, and then sort of motivate why we actually want to use something like Cascades. And so I'll, I'll try to go slow today because there's a lot to cover. And so we might run out of time discussing Cascades, but then we'll, we'll, we'll finish that up on, on Monday next week, OK? All right, so the, the idea of what a query optimizer is doing should be sort of obvious to everyone in this course by now. Um, but the, at a high level, what's going on is that we're going to be given a query from the application written in a declarative language. For us, it's SQL, but it doesn't have to be. And the optimizer's goal is to figure out a correct execution plan for that query uh, that will have uh, what it thinks is the lowest cost. And I'm emphasizing the word at correct and cost here. In the case of correct, again, it's obvious. Right? It doesn't help us if we generate a query plan that's super fast but produces the wrong answer. So we, you know, we always want to make sure that we're, you know, it's, however we transform our query plan into an actual execution plan, make sure that it's actually producing the right result. And then cost, I'm putting in quotes, is because it's going to depend uh, what cost actually means for a particular database system depends on how, what sort of its target operating environment is or what, what it assumes is going, to go, is going on that would cause a query to, to perform slower than another query. Or actually, even slower is not the right word either, right? So in, in our world, it's going to be computational complexity costs, right? What query plans can be faster than another? But this can be uh, measured in different ways, right? It can be measured on, on the amount of data I'm going to process, how many tuples I'm going to produce from one, one operator to the next. If you're on a disk-based system, it can be based on how much disk I.O. you're doing. If you're a distributed database, then it's how much network I.O. you're doing. So all these various things can, you know, well, you know, the cost will change depending on what the system is actually targeting. Um, but what we'll talk about today, the search strategy, um, that doesn't change. It's just this piece here is what you can slide in and out to, to change what, how you're choosing your plans. So as I said before, and I'll emphasize many times, many times today, the query optimizer is the hardest part to actually implement in, in a database system well. Right? We'll see how to do sort of simplistic heuristics that maybe get you some of the way there for simple workloads, but for more complex things, like things more complex than TPCH or TPCDS in real workloads, then you know, having a, a robust optimizer is, is a challenge. And there's been some work done in, the, you know, in theory done in the 1980s that prove uh, selecting the optimal query plan is an MP complete problem. So we're obviously not going to be able to, to generate, even though it's an optimizer, we're not going to be able to always generate the optimal plan, right? And so the way we'll get around this of avoiding having to do an exhaustive search over all possible, you know, query plans or execution plans for a query is we'll rely on techniques to, to tr trim down the search space. So we'll use, use estimation methods to figure out what the actual plan is, the, the cost of executing that plan is without actually having to run it. Um, and then we'll use other techniques like heuristics to cut down on the, the number of plans we actually maybe consider. Like some, like some obvious things we know we, we're not going to ever want to use, so we just throw them out without actually having them be part of our, of our search. So the high-level architecture for looks like this, what we're talking about. So we have at the very beginning, the application sends us a SQL query. And in this, I'm showing these checker, checkered boxes here to, to, to indicate that they're optional. So when a SQL query shows up to the database system, some systems will have what's called a SQL rewriter, where you're actually going to transform the, the, the string of the SQL itself. So this, you often see this in like middleware, that, like things that speak like a MySQL proxy, and the query comes up, and maybe, maybe you route it to a different machine. So you can do this to like route it to the correct shard or by rewriting the SQL query, or 
uh, if there's some kind of um, transformation you want to do in table names or column names. Right? We're not really doing any optimizations here. It's mostly just for, uh, for, for where, where to actually send the query. And like I said, it's optional. Not, most systems don't actually do this. So then the qu SQL query shows up into our parser. The parser then spits out an abstract syntax tree. And this is just the tokens of, of what's, what was actually in the SQL statement itself. Um, and then we pass this into our binder. And our binder is going to do a mapping from names in the SQL query to database entities to internal identifiers. So the, the table is select star from, from table foo. We, we want to map foo. We want to actually check whether foo is an actually valid table uh, by looking in the catalogs and then mapping that to an internal ID or a pointer to the object that represents that table. In our system, it's an object ID or OID because we, we, we follow what Postgres does. So now you have essentially what's called a logical plan. And this is basically almost like the relational algebra of a representation of, of what the plan is actually trying to do. And then you feed this into an optional tree rewriter. And this could be doing some kind of conversion based on heuristics uh, to, to optimize or, or to do further pruning on, on the, the complexity of the query search. Right? So the team, Newton, William, and, um, and Eric are doing this now. Right? They're, they're doing a rewriter for the expressions. But this thing could be rewriting the actual query plan itself or the expressions or predicates within the operators. And again, not every system will actually do this. Or you, and you don't have to. So then you now feed this into the optimizer. And the optimizer that we're going to talk about, talk about today are doing a cost-based search to figure out what the optimal query plan is. Right, so they have some internal cost estimates that they're using based on statistics that they've gathered, gathered about the data to, to reason about whether, again, one plan is better than another. So again, th this, is, this is sort of a high-level pipeline. And the output always is what is called a, a physical plan here. So there's a distinction we need to make that's going to be important as we talk today is this idea of a logical plan versus a physical plan, a logical operator versus a physical operator. The easiest way to think about this is a logical operator is almost equivalent to like the relational algebra exp uh, expression that, you're, that you want to do in your query. I want to join table A with table B. So the logical plan does not specify how you're reading data from table A or table B. Doesn't say whether you're using index, doesn't say whether you're doing a sequential scan, right? And then we don't say how we're actually going to do the join in the logical plan. So I just say join table A, table B. I didn't say whether I want a hash join, a cert merge join, right? Those low-level details about how you would actually execute the query plan are, are, in the, are part of the physical plan, right? So the idea of what's going to happen is here, we're going to have this logical plan, and in this, this pipeline of a query optimization, we want to convert that into a physical plan that we can then execute in our system, in our, in our execution engine, to produce results. So the, the tricky thing that we'll see is that you're not always going to, it's not always going to be a one-to-one -one mapping between a logical plan to a, a physical plan, or a logical operator to a, to a physical operator, right? Um, and the logical plan itself, the logical operators also have no notion of, of what the data actually looks like. So that is all encapsulated in, in the physical operators. So again, I'm, if I'm scanning table A, the logical operator just says read table A. It doesn't say, oh, you're reading this and it's a column store or it's compressed or it's sorted this way. All of that is encapsulated in the physical operators. And again, it's not always going to be a one-to-one -one mapping. So an example would be, Say I have a logical join followed by a logical order by, I can replace those two logical operators with a single physical operator that does a, a sort merge join. Because right? as long as I'm the, the, the order by key is what I'm joining on, then those two logical plans can be collapsed into a single physical plan. Um, and sometimes it can go the other direction. You can have a logical plan explode into multiple physical plans. So this, this is the key thing to understand as we go forward. And when we start doing these transformations, especially in, in cascades, we we'll be transforming logical operators to physical operators, or logical to logical as well. But you don't, you don't really go back. You don't go physical back to logical. So when we talked about correctness, uh, again, the idea here is that we want to do these transformations or convert our logical plans into, in different ways. And we want to make sure that they always produce a correct result. So we want to rely on the equivalency rules within relational algebra for us to identify when one plan is equivalent to another plan, right? So the most obvious thing here, I need to join tables A, B, and C. I can join B and C first, and then join that with A. Well, that's equivalent based on the commutativity property of, of joins, that I can join A and C first, and then join B. And this will produce the same result. 
So the, the associativity, transitivity, relativity, all these rules in relation to algebra are what we're going to leverage in, in our query optimizer to do transformations between logical to logical, logical to physical to generate more optimal plans but still producing the correct result. And then one of the overarching themes as well when we talk about these search strategies is that the software engineering overhead of actually maintaining or using these equivalencies to figure out whether we're generating correct plans is harder in some implementations versus others. Again, like, like especially when we talk about the, the, the stratified search versus unified search, they're both going to essentially kind of produce the same results, but how you actually enforce these things uh, can, can vary. So we don't want to have to write these rules manually. We want to make sure that our transformations can, can don't violate these as they apply them. So the other important thing to talk about, too, is that for today's lecture and for ne the next two ones when we talk about query optimizers, is we're primarily going to be focusing on analytical workloads, right? Because these are where the hard queries, the more complex queries are. And in O2B systems, O2B workloads, the queries are quite simple, and they're often referred to as being sargeable, which is uh, abbreviated for search argument able. It's a term in the 80s. I didn't make, up, make it up. Whatever, right? All right? The basic idea here is that in O2B queries, most of the time you're doing lookups, you're doing predicates, are doing a quality uh, 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 matches on single columns or columns that you have indexes built for. So now all you need to do when the query shows up to try to figure out what the optimal query plan is, it really comes down to picking what is the best index for my query. So if I have column A equals some value, and I have an index on column A, I know I don't need to do any exhaustive search to find what the right index is. I have the index, I just pick that, right? So really simple examples, basically what I just said now. I have table foo, I have a primary key on ID, and that means to, in order to enforce the primary key underneath the covers, the database system creates a unique index. So now when my query shows up and it says where ID equals one, two, three, I just look at that and it's an equality predicate, so I know that I can just use this index. So, the, so picking the right query plan for this query is super simple, All right? And so you see this in other cases too in O2P workloads. If you're doing joins of foreign keys, well, how do you enforce foreign keys? You have an index. So you just use the index to figure out how to, how to join these guys together. So in, in many cases in the uh, in sort of O2P uh, optimized systems or systems that, that are targeting O2P workloads, you don't need to have something very sophisticated like cascades or the system R approach to do query optimization, you can actually get pretty far with this, right? Doing, doing a trick like this. And most, you know, most people, when they build the, the database system the first time, again, unless they're doing analytical workloads, you can get by pretty far with doing this, something like this. And Oracle did this for like 20 years, um, which we'll talk about in a second. Mongo actually still, I, as far as I know, still doesn't have a query uh, optimizer. Um, and they only recently, in the last couple of years, actually started supporting joins. And what they would actually do, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of hacky, but it is kind of clever and it would work for them. So in this case here, it's obvious, right? ID equals one, two, three. I know I'm going to pick this index. But what if it was like ID equals one, two, three and name equals something? So I have two possible indexes I could choose. They would generate both query plans right, to using both indexes and then pick one at random, run it, see how long it took. The same query shows up, they pick the other index, use that, see how long it took, and then just pick whatever one worked the fastest, right? It's simple and it worked for them. Uh, and in, in, in operational workloads, O2B workloads that MongoDB was originally targeting, that works fine. So, and you don't have to maintain statistics about anything. Um, so again, for simplistic workloads, th th this is okay. All right, so we talked a little bit about this in the beginning about doing cost estimation, but all of the things that we're talking about today, except when we talk about heuristics, but all the, the cost-based search, none of this actually works unless you have a good cost model, unless you have a way to make good estimates about whether one plan is going to be better than another plan. Um, and so we'll discuss this, you know, we'll, we'll read a paper and discuss this on, on Wednesday next week. Just in the back of your mind, keep, this, keep, you know, keep thinking about this, like, all right, how are we actually going to do this costing between the different plans? And the basic idea here is that it's usually not going to be tied to something, you know, the cost is not going to be tied to something in the real world. Like, it's not going to say, it's not going to be tied to, you know, wall clock time. It's usually an approximation of the resources that, that will be consumed by the, the query when it actually runs. Um, and then these are just some, a bunch of different examples of the things that we've already talked about 
of how we're actually going to be able to, to, to derive a cost for a particular query. So in our case, an in-memory database is usually going to be the size of intermediate results. You can think, also just look at the complexity of the algorithms, the access methods, how much uh, uh, hardware resources you're using, what the data looks like. So again, the commercial guys have very sophisticated cost models that try to include all of these different things. Uh, in many cases, in, a, in sort of open source systems, it's usually just how much disk or how much memory I'm actually reading to process queries. So again, we'll cover this in more detail uh, next class. But then this is just, so when I say, you know, when we do a cost-based search, we're relying on a cost model that's deriving a, uh, information about what they think the query is going to do to produce some value that allows you to compare the relative performance of two different queries. Right? All right, so now before we get again into the search strategies, let's talk about what we need to be mindful of when we want to build a query optimizer. So we have to care about the granularity optimization and the timing for uh, when we actually invoke it. We're going to talk about how we prepared plans, uh, prepared statements, how do we ensure stability of our plans, which is very important uh, in, in enterprise settings. And then when we, when do we, if we're doing a search-based approach for a, for a query optimizer, when do we stop? So let, we'll go through each of these one by one. So the first is the granularity. And the basic, the basic concept is this, is like, what is the scope of queries that an optimizer is actually looking at? So what people normally think of would be single query granularity, where the application sends a single query and the, the optimizer runs and it only reasons about that one query that, that it was sent, right? And we do this because by only worrying about the one query as we do our search, that limits the scope or the complexity of the problem. Where it's still hard, it's still MP complete, but it just sort of cuts down uh, some constant factors. So the, what usually happens in this case is that we're not going to actually reuse any of the results from our search and from our query optimization across multiple queries. So that means, you know, with the exception of like prepared statements where, where maybe I run the optimizer once, generate a query plan, and I can invoke that multiple times. If I am not caching any query plans, first query shows up, I run the optimizer, same query shows up a little bit later, I'm not reusing any of the, the search information that I've collected from the previous time I ran the optimizer for this new query. It's always like every single query gets optimized from scratch every time. Um, in this case also too, even though you know, I'm doing optimization on a single query, I may also want to worry about what other queries are running at the same time. And so to do this, I have to uh, embed some knowledge in my cost model about what, what resources are being consumed in, in other queries. Uh, running, running at the same time I am. So I know Vertica does something like this. So like Vertica, if you have a query show up, and it may choose a query plan for that particular query that is not the most efficient one if the query is running by itself, but it is running. Uh, it is more efficient when it knows there's other queries running at the same time. So again, this is just like a single query shows up. I run the optimizer for that, and then I produce a, qu a single query plan. Another approach would be to do multiple query planning. Um, and the idea here is that if, I, if I'm told ahead of time, here's a bunch of the queries I'm, I'm going to run together, uh, it can try to meld them to, uh, into a single query plan where we can maybe reuse some of the data structure intermediate results that are, that are generated by different parts of, or different queries instead of every query running by, by itself. So you sort of take a global view of here's what my workload looks like and try to generate a query, an optimized query plan for all those sort of queries together. So of course now the search space is much larger because I'm considering more things at, at once, um, but I may be able to get a better global optimum uh, 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 configuration for, for my queries than I would have if I was looking at, at, a, at, a single, at a single query at a time. You also sometimes see this in, um, there was a system out of, out of Europe called ShareDB where again, you, you, you give it all the queries ahead of time and it tries to figure out how to reuse data across all of them. I don't know how many commercial systems actually do this, but there, there, are, there are academic papers that talk about this problem. All right, the next question is, when do we actually want to invoke our query optimizer? So again, what most people think about uh, when they think about a query optimizer is what's called, doing, called static optimization. Query plan shows up, then you generate the best query plan you can find for it, and then you just sort of execute that. And then you don't go back and revisit uh, that query plan as you run that query. You just say, I set it, I'm going to get it, and it just goes. And, it, it, and if it turns out to be a bad idea while I'm running it, I, I just stick with it. 
right? This is how most systems are, are actually implemented. Um, you can sort of amortize the cost of invoking the, the optimizer for more really expensive queries by using the prepared statements, right? Prepare the statement ahead of time, run the optimizer, generate the query plan, and then every time I invoke that same query, I just reuse that query plan. And we'll see in, in the next slide, though, this can cause problems uh, when you have parameters or variables in your, in your, in your prepared statement. The next approach to do is called dynamic optimization, where you just sort of take the logical plan that, that, that you, you have, you don't actually run an optimizer at all, and then when you actually invoke the, the logical plan, then you do some optimization pass to figure out what is the correct thing to do for, for that part of the query. Right, so you're doing the optimization in sort of subsets, uh, or, or groups of the query plan itself. Um, the, as far as I know, nobody actually does this. Uh, We'll see a little bit something in, in, in ingress in a second that does sort of something like this. Um, right, part of the reason why this is, this is hard, to, hard, to, hard to do is because it's difficult to implement. You sort of have to have, be able to re-enter the optimizer and do, you know, do optimization on a subset of the query every single time. This also makes it hard to debug if it's non-deterministic. Right? How do I, you, know, you may run it the first time and you get one query plan, you run the same query again, and you get a completely different query plan because it's re-optimizing as it goes. Um, there's ways to handle that, as we'll see in Postgres in a few more slides. But again, as far as I know, traditional databases don't do this. You might see this in more stream processing systems. A approach that kind of combines the both of these, try to get the benefits of both of them, is to do uh, adaptive optimization, or what I'll call hybrid optimization. And the idea is that when the query shows up, you first run it through in the first pass to get your uh, first optimized query plan. Then you start running that query. But then you observe whether the assumptions that the optimizer made about what the data looks like when it ran through the optimizer the first time, you see whether that matches with what you're actually seeing on the real data. So, so for example, if I assumed that my predicate was super selective and it was going to start throwing, you know, filtering out a lot of tuples, but then when I start running it, I'm, I'm getting way more tuples than I expected, then I know I probably have a, 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 the query optimizer was incorrect. And I, I, may, I may not have a most efficient plan for what the data actually looks like. So what they can do is if, you, if the error rate for your, the query goes above some threshold, then you go back and, and reinvoke the optimizer, providing some hints about, hey, this is what the data actually looks like, you know, update your estimates, and then it generates a, a new query plan. Um, this idea is about 15 years old. It came out of, at, at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, it, in very recent years, last two years, the commercial systems actually now support this adaptive query optimization. So Oracle has it, SQL Server added it in 2017. I, I, I don't know about DB2. And there's different ways to implement this, right? The, the, the easiest way to do this is I run my query plan. Uh, if I see my estimates are wrong, I just go back to the optimizer, throw away any inter intermittent results that I've already generated, and just start over from scratch every single time. Um, the more sophisticated approaches, which I, I don't know whether they're in the commercial versions, um, is where you can try to figure out, well, I've already scanned this table. Let me keep those results around, and I'll go back to the optimizer and generate a new query plan while, while fixing that operator, uh, you know, at, at the, fi fixing the part of the query plan that I've already executed. Right? And obviously, that may not lead to the most optimal plan, um, so there's trade-offs in both of these approaches. So again, everyone pretty much does this, and this is, this is what we'll focus on today. Uh, Historically, Ingress did this. They don't do it anymore, and this mostly shows up in stream processing systems. And then now, this is something that their commercial systems actually support. All right, the next thing is prepared statements. So again, the the optimizer is a search algorithm, right? It, it's a it's a complex, heavyweight search for complex queries, uh, and the amount of time it's going to take it, it could be non-trivial. Right, so ideally, you know, I don't want to run a 10-second search to find a query plan for a query that's going to run for one second. And so I want to try to come up ways to, to reduce the amount of time I have to spend in my optimizer. So let's say, for whatever reason, this query is super expensive to, to, do, to do query optimization on. Right, it's a three-way join. That's actually nothing that's trivial. But assume that it actually is. So say I'm going to execute this query over and over again. Rather than having to run the query optimizer every single time I, I, this query shows up, I can declare it as a prepared statement, um, and then now I, I just invoke it uh, from the terminal by using the execute, execute command and invoking the prepared statement handle that I defined up above. Right? So now what will happen is when, I, when this execute shows up, the database system says, oh, I know about this prepared statement. I have a cache query plan for it. 
Let me go ahead and, and just reuse that, and, and it skips the optimizer. But now let's say for this query, uh, you know, I've hard-coded some parameters in here, and I want to be able to change this to, to, do, to do the query on different parts of the table. All right, that's not a problem, right? In prepared statements, you can rewrite these to be uh, these placeholder variables. So now at runtime, I pass, them, you know, pass values in like a function, and they get substituted in here. What's the problem? He says you, you pass bad variables. What do you mean by bad variables? Like, let's say normally it's highly selective variables that go in there and you pass just basically select everything. Yes. So he says, like, uh, before, like, in this case here, like, assume these produce, like, let's keep it more simple. I see the query the first time, and I, and, and I maybe run the, the query optimizer, and I generate this query plan like this. But now if I pass in different values for these guys here, that can change the selectivity of these, these filters. And now what was, what was the optimal plan? The optimal plan was join A, B, and then join C. It may now be join A, C, and then B, or, or B and C, and then A, right? So at this point here, even before we invoke the query, we don't know anything about what people are actually going to be passing us. So you know, how do we actually derive what the optimal plan should be? So there's three, three choices. One is we just punt on it and say that we just re-optimize every single time we get invoked with new, new variables that we've never seen before. Um, if we're clever in our, in our software engineering, we can sort of keep track of where we left off in our search optimizer last time uh, and maybe use you know, the best plan we've seen before as a starting point then you know, instead of having to start from scratch all over again. The next approach is to break the, uh, look at the values you could possibly have for these parameters, break them up into quantiles or buckets, and then generate a query plan for you know, some, the average value of each bucket. Then when an invocation shows up, you look to say, well, my, my variables look like this, and that, I have a, you know, that falls in this bucket, and therefore I can, I can use my cache query plan that I had before from, from that one. Um, of course, the problem there is like, you know, it's a multi-dimensional, if you have multi multiple variables, it's a multi-dimensional search space, and how, you know, how many plans you actually need to generate is, is uh, it's not obvious what that should be. It could be quite expensive. And then the last approach is what the, as far as I know, what, for these the commercial systems is the most common one, is that you just choose the average value for every single parameter, and you use that for all invocations for that prepared statement, all right? Um, you can also maybe reason about what the predicates are, like in your query. Like if you know that this thing, instead of being a greater than, if it's an equal sign, and you, this is, you have a unique index on this, then you can reason about that, you know, the, the selectivity is always going to be, you know, you know, one tuple. And then maybe, then you just sort of fix that to be, uh, you know, an index, and everything else is just, you know, you pick the average or something like that. So, again, it's just, the main thing I want to get emphasize here is like this is hard to get prepared statements because you just don't know what's going to show up until later on. The next issue is that we want to have plan stability, and so stability just basically means that if I run the query today and it takes X amount of time, if I or if I run it tomorrow, I want it to be X amount of time, you know, modulo maybe ten percent or something, right? People don't like it if today's query, today the query is super fast, tomorrow it's super slow, and then the next day after that it's super fast. That kind of oscillation is not good because it's hard to pin down what's actually going on that cause performance problems. So the way you can support this in your optimizer to have better stability is to allow the DBA to provide hints to the optimizer about what, how it should, should choose a query plan. And this most common thing is you can pick the join order, you can tell something, you know, do a hash join or build an index on something in the query plan. Um, the next approach is that you can tell the, tell the data system to use an optimizer that you vetted um, and have that produce query plans where you know you're going to have reasonable performance. So Oracle does this. When you, if you download Oracle, like you download the latest one is, is Oracle 18. Included in the Oracle binary is also going to be the, the query optimizer from all a bunch of previous versions. And so you can specify on a per query basis what query optimizer you want Oracle to use, like what version of the query optimizer. And the idea there is like you know that the optimizer is deterministic, and therefore you know what kind of plans it's going to generate, and that, that'll ensure that you have you know, the stability that you want. Of course, that means that if there's some new feature or some new technique in the, in the newer optimizer uh, that, that, that could speed up your query, you're not going to get that because you're pinning your query plan to be from the old optimizer. 
But again, the idea here is like you, nobody wants to have their, uh, you know, you upgrade your database system and 99% of your queries get super fast, but then the 1% query gets super, super slow. People will call and complain, right? No one's going to call and say, hey, my query is so much faster, thanks. They're going to call and complain, my query is so much slower, fix it, right? So this is one way to, to get around that problem. And then uh, another approach is sort of similar to this first one, um, but instead of actually giving hints, you can actually export the query plan generated from the old version of the system, upgrade it, and then feed that back in as a prepared statement to, to fix the query plan um, you know, for, for that query. So SQL Server allows you to do this. SQL Server can dump out the query plan from XML, and then you upgrade your system and, and then load it back in. And again, this avoids having the optimizer trying try out something weird that may cause your query to get slow. All right, the last one is when do we actually want to stop our searches? Um, and so this one's sort of obvious, right? The two basic things are say, all right, I'm just going to let it run for a certain amount of time and stop when I exceed that, that time limit. Um, the next one is when I, uh, if I find a query plan that has a lower cost than some threshold, um, how you define that can vary. Or the last one is if I know that I've exhausted my search days entirely, then I just stop and tick whatever the best plan is I've, I've ever seen. So as far as you know, most systems do this, right? If I, if I exhaust my query plan, then sure, I, my search, I just stop, right? But most of the times, uh, you set a timeout like this. This one is, is, is a bit more tricky to do. Um, and how you balance this versus what the query is actually going to do is, is hard, because like, if my query, if it's going to take me 10 seconds to, to find an optimal query plan, and that query plan is going to take one second to run, if I would just if I could just find a query plan in, in two seconds, and maybe that takes two seconds to run, then I'm better off just not doing the full search. Um, but you know, what the right cutoff is for this it can, can vary. Um, and as far as that, most systems just sort of have a hard-coded value. Like, I mean, you can set it in the, in the config file, but it's just set to an arbitrary number. OK? So any questions about these things? These are the things we have to worry about when, if we actually want to build a real optimizer. Okay, so let's talk about how we actually build an optimizer. So we're going to look at five different approaches. And this is, the way to think about this is like we're going forward in time. The heuristics are the very beginning. Or it's, it's, it's forward in time and forward in, in complexity. So the heuristics ones were the very first ones and are the most simplest. And then the unified stratified search are the more modern ones. Uh, and are the, are they're actually the most complex to implement. So the spoiler would be cascades. It's going to be this last one here. It's going to be an example of a unified search, search strategy. Okay. All right. So the first one is to do heuristic-based optimization, and this is where you just have these static rules in your in your in your optimizer that know how to transform a logical plan to a physical plan, right? And it's the standard you know optimization techniques we teach you in, in the undergrad class, like predicate, limit, projection, pushdowns, uh, doing all selections and filtering before you do any any joins. Right, trying to tr throw out data a a as much as possible. Um, the uh, join order based on cardinality, like you want the bigger table as the outer table and the smaller table as the inner table. Um, and again, the way, again, there's, there's, these are all just sort of hard-coded rules of things you, you, you're pretty sure you're always going to want to do. Like I'm always going to want to do a projection push, push down. I, there, there's very rare cases where I actually I maybe want to put that, put the, 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 sorry, there's rare cases where I may want to put the projection at the very top and not trying to prune early, uh, but you can just hard code rule to always do that. Um, and we'll contrast this with the next examples, the next strategies where you're doing cost-based search. There's no cost model involved in any of this. It's always do it, right? Unless there's some criteria that you identify where you don't want to do this. So this is how things were actually implemented in Stonebreaker's first system, Ingress, out of Berkeley. Um, and then this is what Oracle did surprisingly up until the 1990s. Uh, and it's crazy to think about how popular and how big they've gotten uh, you know, for like 20 years with, with a heuristic-based op optimizer. Um, and talking with people that actually used to work at Oracle on the, on the old optimizer back in the day, they said it was like the, the, the nastiest, like largest piece of code in the entire system, that it was very impressive, but like impossible to like maintain or modify and extend. Because um, it had to do with all these corner cases to do all the all these rules, and it's just you know it was all written in C, right? There wasn't any any sort of high level language describing what the rule actually was, right? So you may think hey, this is crazy. How did they get so far with you know this the, the simplest approach? Um, you got to understand back in the day, at least in the 1990s, 
you know, they're not running the super complex queries that people are running today. Right? So like, you know, 75-way joins were probably not that common back then, so you, you didn't have to worry about these things. Um, you know, they didn't have CTEs, they didn't have window functions. Um, I would say, so the thing I'll also say too is like, when you build a data system for the first time, this is pretty much what everyone does. We did this in HDR and VoltDB, we did this in Peloton, right? Because this is like, this is the chargeable stuff. Like, I want to pick an index to use for my query. That, that's a heuristic. So that's an example of what this is. So I want to go through an example of what Ingress did, because I think it's kind of interesting. And it's, again, it's more of an intellectual curiosity. It's not, a, uh, it's not saying we should do it this way. It's just an example of what people have done. And again, it'll, it'll help motivate why we're going to do things with Cascades or Starburst uh, in a much more disciplined manner. So we're going to use this simple uh, sample database here. We have three tables, artist, album, and peers. And this is just like Spotify or, or a music, music web app, right? An artist appears on albums, right? So there's a foreign key reference uh, from, from this table to these two tables here. So we're going to do a query that wants to get all the artists, the name of the artists that appear on my mixtape. So it's a three-way join between artist, appears, and album. And then we're only doing, doing a lookup on, on, on my tape here, right? So the way Ingress is going to do this is, is, is it can't do joins, right? It can only execute single table queries. So it has to rewrite this using heuristics to put everything into a single table form. So the first thing they're going to do is they're going to decompose the, the query into single value queries, meaning where we're only going to do a single lookup on a single value in, in our where clause here. Right? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to break out album, uh, the, the lookup on album. We're going to move that into a separate query, and then we're going to write it into a temp table one. And then we rewrite the, the, the original query. Instead of doing a join on album, it's going to do a join on the temp table that's generated by this query up here. So then now we're going to take this guy, decompose it further, all right, and now break it out so that it's a join between temp1 and on the appears table and a join between artist2 from the temp table generated by this query here. All right? Again, these are just heuristics. They, they can do this rewriting. And they're operating on the, on the logical query plan, not the actual SQL string itself, at least as, as far as I understand from the paper. All right, so then the next step is now, because now they, they want to remove all of these joins and substitute them with the values that are generated from the, the previous queries here. So this very top one here, this one is, is not accessing any other temp table. Right? This is sort of the root of, of, of the execution plan. So I'm, I'm going to execute this one first, produce, produce a value, which I then now substitute here to replace the, the, the value that this guy is trying to join on. So I, so I, I replace the lookup on the temp table from the album ID. I place that with 999, because that's coming from this guy. It now produces a result, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six. So then I come back down here for this last query. And because I have two, two values here, they didn't support in clauses in the 1970s. So they have to rewrite this to be two separate queries, one on one, two, three, and one on four, five, six. And then you run this, then you produce a result. Right? And, you, and you just you know, coalesce these two, and, that, and that's your answer. Crazy, right? It's kind of cool. Uh, Obviously, super inefficient, right? But you understand it's the 1970s. So that paper that describes how they do this talks about, oh yeah, we're operating on a table with 300 tuples, right? Because the hardware was super limited, the size of the data they had to manage was much smaller. So in that environment, this 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 works, right? Okay. So what are the advantages of heuristic-based optimization? Well, it's easy-ish to implement and debug. Right, because you you know how to write test cases that go after the rules that you define and actually you know see whether it actually produces the correct result. Um, and for simple queries, this works reasonably well, and it's actually be super fast, right? Because there's no search. It's just does my query look like this? If yes, rewrite it this way. All right. Now the downside is going to be it's going to require on magic constants in your code to predict the whether the choice you're making is good or not. Right. So is 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 should this table be the outer table versus the inner table? There's some you know, magic you have to, you know, you're hard coding in there to try to figure that out. And then when you start having complex queries, this is just not going to work at all because there's going to be uh, you know, complex interdependencies with different, different parts of the queries, different operators in our query plan that we're just not going to be able to reason about because we're sort of only doing these simplistic rules. So like I said, so, so 
when you build a data set for the first time, if you want to have a basic query optimizer, you do something like this. And then eventually you, 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 you throw it away and, and start over, or you build something more sophisticated, which is what we did. All right, so this was the approach used by two out of the three first relational database systems of the 1970s, so Ingress and Oracle. The other uh, relational database in the 1970s was, was IBM System R. And they actually did what is most often used even today in systems like Postgres and MySQL and, and most open source database systems. So you, this one is going to be a combination of the heuristic-based optimization that we showed in, in Ingress, but then now they're, not, they're going to include a cost-based search to do optimizations like, like join orders. So as I, as I said many times with the System R project, they got a bunch of people that had fresh PhDs into a room, they took Ted Ka's paper and says, oh, let's go build this, and everyone carved off their own piece. Pat Selinger got actually the, she worked on the, on the query optimizer. Um, and she was at, she, she just retired recently, but she was at uh, Salesforce, and I had a, a great student who took my class two years ago, and then she's, she's at now at, at Salesforce working on their database system, and then she didn't realize until after the retirement party that the Pat Selinger she was having cake with was this Pat Selinger from the class that built the query optimizer, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, so she, she's quite famous in, in the database world. So this is an example of the first cost-based query optimizer for, for a, a database system. And again, the argument back then, the same way we talked about with compilers, was that the people claimed that, oh, you know, a declarative language like SQL or Quell, they're never going to be able to generate an optimal query plan as efficient to the one actually written by humans. So this is sort of the first approach to show that you know, it's not, not the case. The optimizer can do, can do this better than a human can do. So we won't talk about what this actually means uh, uh, in detail just now. In a few more slides, we will. But the system R approach is an example of doing what's called bottom-up planning, where we're sort of going to start with nothing in our query plan and start go from the bottom up and start adding in pieces we need to actually compute the answer that we want. Right? And whereas Cascades is a top-down model, which we'll see in a second. So, as I said, IBM implemented this in System R when they went off and built DB2 in the early 1980s. As far as I know, they, they, they took the System R query optimizer and ported it over to work in DB2. Uh, eventually, in the later in the 1980s, they got rid of it. Um, and, but this is the approach now that's used in pretty much every open source relational database system that's out there. So, like the, the major ones, MySQL, Postgres. Postgres has a variant of a different type of, of uh, optimizer we'll, we'll see in a second. But, like if you have less than 13 tab tables in your query, you get the system R approach. All right, so let's go, let's go see how system R does this. So what they're gonna do is they're first gonna break up the query into blocks. Uh, and again, we're operating on, on logical operators here, not, not natural SQL. Um, and then for each of these logical operator in a block, we're then gonna generate a set of physical operators uh, that can be used to execute it or implement the, what we want our logical operator to do. So it's going to generate all possible physical operators for us. Uh, and then now they're going to do a search to try to construct a left deep tree that minimizes the amount of work or amount of data we're going to, we're going to have to read from disk uh, in, in that physical plan. So this, this is an example of, of, the, uh, of some of the methods they're going to use to cut down the search base or the complexity of the problem that they're trying to solve in, in trying to find an optimal query plan. So they're only going to look at left deep trees, where the joins only go up on the left side of the, of the, the query plan, as opposed to like a bushy tree, where joins can be in any part of the tree, or a right, right deep tree. Right? They throw all those away and only look at left deep ones. And they're also going to throw away Cartesian products as well, Cartesian joins, because you almost never, never need those. All right, so let's say now we extend our query we had before for looking up all the people, the, the name of the people that, were, that are on my mixtape, but now we're going to add an order by clause. We want to sort them by artist ID. And I'm doing this because this is going to highlight a key deficiency of what, of, of, of system, system R's approach. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we have to choose the best access path for each table. So all that is just looking at the three tables I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I'm scanning in my, um, in my, in my, joint, my query. And I just use heuristics to figure out, oh, do I have an index for what they're trying to look up on? If yes, I pick that. Otherwise, I fall back to a index scan. Right? So in this case here, we're doing a lookup on name on album. Assuming we have an index for that, then we can use that as an index, index scan, where everything else is a sequential scan. Then now, for each uh, for, for my joins, I'm going to enumerate all possible join orders for these guys. 
again, at a, at a logical level, right? So again, like I can do artists, joint artists and peers and album or peers and album and so forth. I'm throwing in Cartesian products because again, you can join like that, but then they'll prune all these. And this again, this is exponential. So this is all possible orderings of, of these guys. So then now I want to then determine the join ordering from my list here that's going to have the lowest cost. And so to do that, they're going to do a search, a divide and conquer approach, where they're going to break up, uh, they're, they're going to do, uh, they're going to do estimation for the cost of doing a join in stages, get to my endpoint, which is the final result that I want, and then backtrack and figure out what was the fastest way for me to get there. All right, so it looks like this. So say at this, this is the bottom. I should rotate this. So this is, think of this as the bottom, and that's the top. So at here, I have uh, nobody's joined. Nobody's joined together. But then for each node here at the next the next step, I'm either joining album and peers or artists and peers, and then I have all other possible uh, orderings as well. And then my final destination is when, when the three tables are joined together. So the edges between this node and this node are all the, the physical operators I could use. So I could do a, either a sort merge join or hash join for, for both of these. And so for each of these, I'm going to compute their cost using my cost model to figure out which one is, is actually the cheapest. And then for each, to get from this node to this node, I pick which one, whatever one's the best. And then now at the next stage, I do the same thing. To get from here to here for both, both, both nodes, I look at all possible physical operators I could use, pick which one has the lowest cost, right? And now I get to my endpoint. So now I'm going to backtrack and figure out which, which path along this, you know, from, you know, in, in, which path from these different nodes actually produces the one with the lowest cost, right? And that's, that's how I pick my physical plan. What's missing here? How did I change the query? I added the order by. There's nothing in here that talks about sort order, right? Right. So the way they had to get around that was you have to bake in now your cost model some information or expectation of what the data needs to look like in your final output. And then you use that to make a change on what the cost estimate is going to be, right? So in this case here, I would say, oh, I know my uh, query needs to be sorted by artist ID. I have a sort merge join here on artist ID. That'll put me in the sort of order that I want. Therefore, that should have a lower cost than the hash join, right? So there's no way to sort of introduce like an order by clause here in, to, in this. So our baking logic, our baking knowledge about what the data I, I, we're, we're, we're disconnecting information on what the data needs to look like from our search strategy uh, and by embedding it in the cost model, which actually might not be the right, is not the right place to have it. Okay? All right, so we talked a little bit about this uh, very briefly, um, but I want to bring it up now the distinction between the, the top down versus bottom up. So the system R approach that I showed you is a bottom up, even though I was going from, from, from left to right. Um, so the idea here is you start with nothing. You start with, the, you have all my tables and none, none of them are joined or none of them are, are, are being processed in any way. And then I build up my join orderings until I get to my very top that has all the data that I want or has data in, in, in the joined in, in, in the way that I, I expect. Top down, which is what Volcano and Cascades are going to use, I start with what my, what my answer to be and then I search down and figure out what nodes are, do I need to add in my query plan to get me to where I want to go. Now, at a high level, these two approaches are, are semantically the same. Right? They're going to produce you know, a near optimal query plan uh, that, that produces the result that I want. The, I, in my opinion, and this, is, this almost gets I'm sorry, a religious debate, in my opinion, this is the better way to do this because you can reason about, uh, you can reason about the query plan as you go down and uh, you know, prune out branches where you know there, there's never going to be a, a, a better path to get to where you want to go. Um, this, is, I mean, this is also independent whether it's stratified or unified. Cascades is a unified approach. I, in my opinion, unified top-down is the way to go. The Germans disagree with me. That's fine. Uh, again, this will make more sense as we talk about Cascades and Volcano and, and Starburst. But just to understand, System R is a bottom-up approach. Cascades is a top-down approach. So I want to talk a little bit about what Postgres does, at least for what, what you normally get in Postgres when you run with queries that are less than 13 tables. We'll talk about what happens when you actually run with queries that are more than 13 tables um, in a second. But the, 
Postgres is, is an example of a heuristics plus a, uh, a cost-based search. And so the way it works is that they have these stages, explicit stages, that do different types of optimizations on your query plan. And there's baked into the code these assumptions about what the, the output of one stage needs to be as input into the next stage. And this is why, again, I like the unified model because you just sort of throw everything into the, 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 the single search. And it just you know d does the optimization for you. Where in this one, excuse me, this one here is like you have to do rewriting, and then you do the cost-based search, and then everything else I think is like aggregations and order by. These are then added back into your query plan, uh, independent of the search that you actually did here. So we uh, one of the main developers of Postgres, Tom Lane, actually lives in Pittsburgh. He's CMU alum. He got his PhD here in the 1990s, not in databases like software engineering. When we first started building Peloton, we were using Postgres as a starting, starting point, and we had lunch with him to, to discuss like, you know, the various parts of the system we, we thought we wanted to reuse. And one of the big ones was the optimizer. Um, so this is maybe three or four years ago. And when we started asking questions like how to fix this in the optimizer, how to change this, he's like, yeah, that, that's a nasty piece of code uh, that nobody really touches because it's, really, it's sort of brittle and um, it's difficult to understand. Uh, and so he sort of said this, like, you know, so the, the, the darkest part, the darkest corners of Postgres were actually in the query optimizer. And when we, when we actually look at the code, we, I, we, I agree with him. Uh, it may have changed. I haven't, I haven't looked at it in several years, um, but it was a pain in the ass to modify or extend just because, again, there was baked in the code all these assumptions about what the, the query plan needed to look like as you go from one stage to the next. All right, so. What are the advantages of the, of the, 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 the system R approach? Well, it, it usually finds a reasonably good plan without having to, to perform the exhaustive search. Now the downside though is that we have all the same problems we had before with the heuristic based uh, approach because that, you know, that's the first stage of this. We do heuristics and then we do our search. So all the problems we had before still, still carry over into this one. Um, now taking left deep doing trees, this is a system R uh, specific optimization. In modern systems they actually can consider you can set a right deep of bushy, bushy trees. There's nothing about the search strategy that says you have to take this assumption. It's just, it's just what system R did. And, but I would say the biggest problem, and the, their example was what I said before about the sort order, where you have to bake into the cost model some notion of what the physical properties of the data should look like and use, and use the cost model as a way to, to, enforce, to enforce that, to, to that it picks one plan that pick, it gives a high cost to query plans or operators that put that modify the data or put the data in the form that, you, that, it, that it shouldn't be in to produce the correct result. All right, the next class of algorithms are due to, or, or, or the next approach to doing crop optimization is to do randomized algorithms. And the idea here is that rather than doing a guided search through, uh, you know, through a, a branch of bound model or, or the, the system R dynamic programming approach, you just take a random walk over the, the all possible query plans you could have and then hope that you find one that actually produces, uh, that it's actually more efficient, right? So this is a good example where you just keep going, keep do, you can do this forever, so obviously you wanna stop after a certain amount of time or when you, you exhaust some cost threshold. And so I'll, I'll show you an example of what Postgres does. Um, but the first approach that, that did something like this was the 1980s, they were doing simulated annealing. And the basic idea is that you take, the, you take a query plan that's generated using heuristic only approach, and then you should start swapping things, stop, you know, changing query plans in different ways, like changing the join order of two tables. Check to see whether the cost of that new query plan is better than what you've, the best one you've seen so far. Right? And so what happened is if you have one that, uh, that, that produces a, a better, better query plan with a lower cost, then you always accept that change. And then now you use that and permute, <coughs> permute that one and jump somewhere else in the solution space. Or if the permutation actually makes things worse, you sort of flip a weighted coin to decide whether you actually want to keep that. And then, you know, if not, then you, then you, you revert it and flip back something else. If yes, then you continue forward on that. And the idea there is it allows you to break out of, of local minimums, right? But again, it's super important. This goes back to our relational algebra equivalency rules. So we want to make sure that anytime we do a, a, a flip in a query plan, that it's equivalent to the query plan we just came from because we don't want to you know, permute something and have it produce incorrect results. So you sort of have to, every, every single time you, you make a transformation, you do this check. As far as you know, nobody actually implements this one. Um, but Postgres has something interesting uh, where they use a genetic algorithm that's sort of similar to simulated annealing, but, uh, 
but where they going to they're going to t generate a bunch of query plans in each round then they choose which they look at which one has the the the, the lowest cost or this sorry which one has the worst cost they throw that one away and then they pick some genes if you want to call it that of 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 the query plans that that have the best cost then you flip those things around then do another round all right and see whether you have it produces a better query plan the idea is you're you're, you're taking query plans that are good mating them together to produce new offspring that may produce an even better or more efficient query plan, right? So again, Postgres only does this if you throw out a query that has 13 or more tables that you're joining together. Otherwise, they fall back to the system R approach. I don't know how well this, how, how well this works. I, I actually have not seen any, any studies that show, you know, is, is this actually better than the, um, than the system R approach in, in, for Postgres's implementation? So again, super simple example here. I'm joining three tables. In the very first generation, I just generate a bunch of ran random, uh, you know, random query plans. I then cost them, figure out which one is, th is the best cost, and that becomes the best cost I've ever seen. Take the one that has the lowest cost, or sorry, the worst cost, throw that away, pick some random genes from, from my, my best ones, and then produce new offspring that have this, right? And then same thing, I cost them again, pick which one is the best, throw away which one is the worst, Get them to, to to mate and then spit out new new offspring and keep going like that, right? Again, the idea here is that rather than you, you, this allows you to break out a local minimums in in your multi-dimensional search space. So this may stumble upon a better query plan, but it's not guaranteed to do that because it's random. So again, the advantage is basically what I said: you jump around and 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 try to find things you may not be able to search for. Uh, you may not search for uh, in in a dynamic programming or a branch bound search. Um, it has low memory overhead if you don't keep track of any information about you've, what you've collected from one generation or one stage to the next. Um, there's no path you need to keep track of. You, know, you don't say, how did I actually get to the offspring I'm at now? You just say, I flip a coin and here's where I ended up. So what are the downsides of this? Well, one is that you may not have any idea of why you ended up choosing a particular query plan which may not be good, because how do you actually go back and reproduce that? You also have to do some extra work to make sure that your query plans are deterministic and stable, meaning I take the same query, I throw it through my, my genetic algorithm. Today, I want to make sure that I come back tomorrow, I end up with something, uh, the, the same query plan. And so the way Postgres does this, they basically always use, they seed the random number generator deterministically so that the same query plan always starts off with the same random, random values. And then we still have to implement our correctness rules to make sure that you know, the, the permutations don't end us up in an in in invalid state. Okay? All right. So we'll get through Volcano, and then I'll, 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 I'll stop there. Okay? Because we only have 15 minutes left. All right. So I just basically showed you the last 25, 30 years, the first 25, 30 years of, of query optimizers. The... All of these implementations were written in, you know, like a procedural language like C, C++, or whatever the, the base data system was written in. And so the problem with this is that because these are imperative languages, it's hard for us to reason about whether the transformations or the, or the, the changes we're making to our query plan to optimize it are producing correct results. Again, I just said this the last slide. We have to hard code a bunch of extra checks we have to, in like the Postgres to make sure that our permutations are, are valid. So there's no easy way to, to, for us to verify that their optimizer is going to be generating uh, correct query plans without basically doing fuzz or soak testing. Take a bunch of sample queries, throw it through the optimizer, and make sure that it produces the correct results. So the other aspect of this is that the, in a bunch of these examples, there's, there's, the, um, there's this separation between the transformation from logical to physical versus the overall semantics of what the query is actually trying to do. So that means that like in these, all these approaches, it's, they're sort of doing these operations on a localized, uh, you know, on a localized operator in the query plan. They're not looking at the bigger picture of what the query plan is actually trying to do. Right? And they, they, they make, because they have to do this because it's, it's very complex to do this query planning. So they sort of carving off a small piece and doing divide and conquer approach. So now, the techniques we're going to get into now are called optimizer generators, but the idea is that we want to be able to declare our rules or write our transformation rules to do query optimization in a high-level declarative language like a DSL, and then 
feed them into a compiler, which then generates a optimizer for us that can then apply those transformation rules. So this was a big thing in the 1980s and, and 1990s. Again, rather than hard coding in, in, in your system, like, you know, here's, here's, my, here's my optimizer, I'm gonna have a separate config file that has all my rules, and then I feed that into a compiler that then spits out the, the C++ code or C code that can then do those transformations, all right? So now, the two different ways you can organize what these optimizers look like uh, is to do either a stratified search or a unified search. The other big thing too also about, about these, these, uh, these newer implementations, and again, newer means like 1980s, 1990s, before some of you were born, but that's okay, uh, is that instead of having the, 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 the cost model have to reason about the physical properties of the data, like is it sorted or not, we're now gonna treat that as a first class concept, or a first class entity in our transformation rules to make sure that uh, we're putting, you know, we, we can reason about what the data should look like, what the data actually looks like when it feeds or feeds into an operator and when it comes out of the operator. So the sort order one is, is the most obvious one. Where in, in the system R approach, I, in my search algorithm itself, I wasn't actually considering sort order. It's only in the cost model did I take that, you know, did, did, did I account for that. But now we can include this directly in, into our search. So stratified search is essentially the same thing as the, 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 the system R approach, where you have heuristics followed by a cost-based search. But again, the difference here is that we're going to write our transformation rules uh, in something that looks like relational calculus, and then the engine that we feed our transformation rules into can then reason about whether those rules are, are correct or not. So we're defining what it means to do a transformation based on you know, the equivalency rules, and then the, the, the engine can say, oh yes, this would actually, this is a correct trans transformation or this is not a correct tra transformation, right? And so the, the, the first step is just heuristics, you know, using these declarative rules where you don't have a cost-based search, and then the second step is the, where you're doing the cost-based search, right? And that's converging the logical plan to physical plan. So this is like logical to logical, and this is logical to physical. So the most famous one uh, was a project out of IBM research called Starburst. Uh, and as I said, when they first started building DB2, they used the system or optimizer. Then it, at some point, it, that became too difficult to maintain. So then, then they started the Starburst project. And as far as I know, DB2 still uses the Starburst, Starburst approach. You know, it's probably not using the same code. It's been modified over you know, several decades. But at a high level, it works basically the same way. So this is, again, this is the one where I don't, I don't want to pretend that I fully understand what they're actually doing. Like if you go read the original paper, you'll see they all, all these relational calculus rules, which I'm, it's a pain to read. But at a high level, it's pretty straightforward, right? You define some kind of rules. In their case, they're using SGML, or that looks like relational calculus. And then it knows how to do these transformation uh, rewrites. And then we do a system R dynamic programming search um, once this part's done. And I think like, Oracle uses this in, in, in their, it's the latest, it's the way they implement their optimizer today. The advantages of this is that uh, in practice it works well, at least according to uh, the, you know, their papers and, and what people say in, 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 the, in the, what people, IBM developers have told me. Uh, of course now they, it was Guy Lohman, he did implement it, he said it worked great, which, uh, take that with a grain of salt I suppose. But, um, I think the big advantage you're getting for this is from a software engineering standpoint where you're not sort of having this hard-coded if clauses to figure out whether you have all these matches. And actually, this is sort of similar to what we were talking about, uh, what, what Eric and his team was talking about when they presented about how they define these rules in, in their engine and it, just, it does these transformations. Um, the, last year, the team that did transformation rules in our system had all these if clauses scattered out throughout the different systems to do rewriting. But now we have a single engine that can do all this. So that's sort of what the, this, this approach gives us. So the disadvantage of the Starburst approach is that, at least in the original implementation, it was hard to assign, assign priorities for transformations. So there are some transformations that may be more important to look at first, because you'll get the, the most, most performance speed up. But you couldn't do that in, in, the, in the original implementation. Um, some transformations are also not possible to assess whether they're good or not without making multiple invocations of the cost model, right? That, I think that was engineering, that one's sort of fixed. 
And then this one I actually still buy, and if they're still using the relational calculus language that was defined in the original Starburst paper. Maintaining these rules are a big pain because it's not C++ code or C code that most people understand. It's like this other, you know, other D DSL that is unnatural for, you know, systems programmers to normally write. All right, to finish up real quickly, uh, we we'll just discussed the unified approach. And again, I'm biased. This is what I like. Um, and this is what we use in our system. So rather than having a separate stage to go from logical to logical and then, log and then a separate stage to go logical to physical, we're going to have a single search, search, search model that do does everything, right? And everything is just going to be defined as transformations. So the, the rule engine can fire and say, I, it makes sense for me to do a logical logical transformation here or logical physical here. And I don't have to reason about anything about the, you know, do I do one first before the other, right? I, I can do a logical logical and logical physical and, and determine whether one is better than the other at that, at that moment without, you know, waiting to get to a separate, separate stage. So now, the thing about this though is that because uh, we're going to now be doing logical logical transformations in our search, this is going to end up generating way more transformations that may end up being redundant. Uh, you know, if I, I can do a logical logical transformation from, from join A, A join B, I can transform that, transform that to B join A, but now I, I may want to, you know, it may, the rule may fire to go back the, the other way, and A join B. So the way to, to avoid all these uh, redundant computations is I'm going to use a mem memoization table to keep track of what rules I've fired before and I, I know that I, I, I don't need to re, re, revisit them in my search. Of course, now this becomes expensive to maintain, but that, that's unavoidable. So the, there's actually three, uh, well, Gertz Graffy did the Cascades model that you guys wrote about, but he actually did two other cost models, or sorry, uh, search, search engines, or search optimizer generators prior to the Cascades one. The first one was called Exodus, the second one was called Volcano, and the third one was Cascades, and that, that was his last one. Um, the, this is the same Volcano when we talk about the Volcano Iterator model for query processing. This is the same guy that read the, the paper you guys wrote, or sorry, you read the paper that he wrote on uh, index latching at the beginning of the semester. The same Gertz Graphy. Um, and so for this one, what they're going to do that's different is that they're going to embed now the uh, they're going to embed the physical properties in the actual uh, operators themselves, and then the rules can then again reason about whether the transformation you're trying to do is will hold or is valid based on what the physical properties it expects to have. And so again, this is also now an example of a top-down approach which we'll see in the next slide, where we start from the beginning. We start with the outcome we know we want, and we figure out what steps we need to do to, to get us get us to that point. Now. Uh, for Exodus, that was in the 1980s. I don't think that, that, that went anywhere. For Volcano, as far as I know, at least from reading from the papers, is that this was never actually implemented in a commercial system. There's a bunch of other academic systems that took his uh, compiler framework and, and used that, or optimizer framework, and used it in their own systems. But no one actually ended up putting this in, in a commercial system. Whereas Cascades is being used in SQL Server today, and SQL Server probably has the, the best query optimizer. Okay, so let's look at an example here. So again, the idea of a top-down approach is that we start at the very beginning, we know, what, we know what we want our final result to be, right? So for us, for that query, we're looking up the, the, the artist on my mixtape, and we want to order by artist ID. We want to have artist join, peers joins album, and we want to order by the artist ID. And so now in my operator, I'm, I'm embedding what I want the, the, the sort order to be for, for my data. So now I'm going to have a bunch of rules that I've predefined allow me to do transformations to figure out uh, how to get me back up to where I want to be. So say you have a bunch of these logical operators here, right? Joining artists, the, the, the tables in different ways, and do, d scans in different ways. So I can either do logical to logical transformations, like jo join A, B to join B, join A, or I can take a logical, a logical to physical transformation to take one of these join algorithms and transform them into a particular join algorithm. Or sorry, I, this, I wouldn't do this logical join and pick an actual algorithm I want to use. All right, so let's say in this one here, I could do a transformation on, uh, on, on, on these tables here to join, doing a sort merge join. And then now I can figure out what do I need to do to feed in the operators into this, to this physical operator. So I want to do a scan on album, and then I have a join on artists and appears. 
and then I can keep going down here and now say, all right, that can be a hash join, and how do I feed data into this? And I can cost this as, as I go down. Right? I can also do a cert merge join, like, like that. So the thing, go again, what's different about here is that we have what are now called enforcer rules. Basically, they're going to ensure that the data looks like the, what, what we want right, as our input. So in this case here, this is a sort merge join. So we know that would satisfy the enforcer rule for the, the physical, physical property of the data. So this is valid. But if I have a hash join like this, this is going to generate a random sort order. So I know that violates my enforcer rule. So I go ahead and just cut that off. And then this is a branch and bound search. So if now if I introduce things like a quick sort, I can cost whatever that is, and figure out how much that costs, it's going to cost me to do this. Then now as I traverse down the tree and say I add a hash join, as soon as I know that, that this path is more expensive than uh, the best path I've seen so far, so say this, this sort merge here, then I can just prune that off and not traverse down and look at, look at the other aspects of the query plan. All right? So again, for me, this, for whatever reason, I'm, it's easier for me to reason about this kind of stuff, although this, this approach is not perfect, um, than sort of the, the, the heuristics. And I think this is also easier, easier to implement and maintain. So to finish up real quickly, what are the advantages of, of the, the volcano approach? Again, we have these declarative rules that allow us to, to implement these transformations. And then it's easy for us to extend our, 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 once we have a basic search engine, we can extend and add new rules without having to modify any aspect of the actual the search algorithm itself. We just declare these rules and they get fired off in the engine as it does the traversal. So now the downside is, is specific to Volcano, is that what happens is that every single time I do a transformation, right, I, I land on a logical operator, and I want to figure out what are the other children I could consider, it fires all the rules first, explodes your search base, uh, and then you have to traverse down to figure out what the cost of all those are. Right, and Cascades is not going to do that. Cascades is actually going to apply our transformations on the fly as needed, right? And then not, not easy to modify programs. Oh yeah, Th this approach couldn't do the, could not do the expression tree rewriting or predicate rewriting uh, that we talked about before with with Eric and Newton and Williams group. Okay. All right. So just as a teaser, I should have made this three lectures. I don't know why I do this. Actually, we have. No, there's no way I'm going to get through this. Yeah, sorry. All right, so we'll, we'll, just as a teaser, like what Cascades is going to do that's different than Volcano is that it's going to be the same kind of thing where you have all these, these logical, 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 physical transformations. You still have the enforcer rules for the physical properties. The, uh, the difference now, though, is that they're going to materialize those transformations on the fly rather than all at once every single time you land on an operator. And it's going to do uh, sort of this, this grouping technique to allow you to then reason about portions of the query plan uh, without exploding off exactly what, how it actually will implement it. So I can take, if I want to join three tables, I can say, well, let me pick my join order for the, my, in, my, the, my first two tables and not worry about how I join the other one. Where in, in the volcano approach, you can't do that. Again, it, it'll make more sense next class. But I, I had you guys read that master's thesis because... There is original Cascades paper from 1995. I think it's terrible. What? It's, not, it's a bad paper. Like it doesn't really explain exactly what it is. That master's thesis I had you guys read is like that's the, to me those 30 pages are the, are the best explanation of what how Cascades actually works. Right. So that's why I had you guys read that. All right. So let's let's stop here. Um, we'll pick up uh, next class. Uh, but in the paper you're going to read over the weekend from Monday is the. Uh, is a updated version of doing the system R dynamic programming search, the bottom up approach, up approach written by the, the Germans, the hyper guys. And so they argue Cascades is a bad idea and that the, the, the system R approach is actually the right way to go. I don't, I, I don't have a strong enough opinion yet to see whether they're right or not. Although the, the Cascades guy says he, don't use Cascades either. Or don't use Cascades in the way that, that we're using it, which, which is fine. All right, any questions? Got a bounce to get the 40 ounce bottle. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle, I'll guzzle cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got sore cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw my three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, oops, don't spill it. Cause
ain't eyes and say the pain I sweat You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head Take back the pack of duds We gon' get you some same knives and drink it to the studs Billy D is the chili cheese, the talented weak guys Be a man and get a can of snake eyes